I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so Genoveva is a scientist, physician, studying mechanism of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders and conducting clinical research on development of new treatments. She has a PhD in immunology, where she worked on monoclonal antibodies for in vivo human use. Genoveva has a postdoc and assistant professor in the lab of Professor Ben Weiss at Drexel University, where she constructed D2 dopamine receptor antisense RNA vector, studied its effects in vitro in the mouse brain, and developed antisense RNA gene therapy. She's a psychiatry resident fellow on Professor Eric Hollander's team at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where she develops treatments for autism, OCD, depression, anxiety, and orphan diseases. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mariana and Ben. I want to uh, say good morning to everyone and to thank the VITA conference, uh, Lindsay, Ben, Rebecca, and Ali for the opportunity to present our studies. The um, first conference was very interesting and I'm very excited to participate in the second one. As Mariana said, these studies are uh, done when I was a postdoc in the lab of Professor Ben Weiss at the Department of Pharmacology at Drexel University. And briefly, to outline what I will be talking about, first I will give an overview of the antisense strategies to block D2 receptors in brain. Then I will talk briefly about antisense oligos to the T2 receptors because they're the predecessor to the antisense RNA. Then the construction and characterization of the D2 dopamine receptor antisense RNA expressed by a non-viral plasmid vector, which from now I will refer to just as D2 antisense RNA. Effects of the D2 antisense RNA in vitro in cells HK293 cells, and then in vivo in mouse brain in several mouse models. First, we used a model of dopaminergic supersensitivity, the 6 hydroxydopamine lesion mouse model. And then we used normal sensitive mice where we compared the effects of the D20 sense RNA vector with those of a conventional neuroleptic haloperidol, which also blocks D2 receptors, but as you know, has some side effects. And then we wanted to see the mechanism by which the D20 sense RNA acts, and we determined that it inhibits a pool of functional D2 receptors. And in the end, I will just briefly touch upon the potential of the D2 antisense RNA to study D2 mediated behaviors in vivo and processes in vitro and to treat brain disorders with D2 dopaminergic hyperactivity. And first to say this is a project I was very excited about because it introduced me to neuroscience. It's done from a neuropharmacological standpoint, and I poured my heart into it weeks and weekends, and I'm thankful to my mentor, Professor Ben Weiss, who was always very encouraging, um, and let you be creative. Uh, just to mention briefly the dopamine receptors, although everyone here knows about them, in case someone is listening to the seminar who is not so familiar with them, um, the neuromodulator and neurotransmitter dopamine has two types of receptors, D1-like, D1, and D5. Um, they're G-protein coupled receptors, and these are coupled to GS, stimulatory, and D2-like, the D2, D3, D4, which are coupled to GI. Why is this important? Because we want to specifically inhibit 
just the D2 receptor subtype. And as you know, many of the pharmacological drugs which block dopamine receptors block several dopamine receptor subtypes and not only dopamine but serotonin in other molecules in brain. And this is a figure showing the seven transmembrane structure of the receptor and dopamine as you know is involved in many important processes in brain emotions, cognition, reward, movement, hormonal actions, and in many neuropsychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, depression, ADHD, addiction, Huntington's and Parkinson's, which we want to study and treat. And briefly to summarize the main dopamine pathways in brain, because you will see they are important for the effects of the drugs that block dopamine receptors and their side effects. First, there is the mesolimbic pathway, which starts from the ventral tegmental area to the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens and olfactory tubercle. And this is the main dopamine pathway in reward, motivation, and emotions. And it is believed that the antipsychotic drugs act here. Another pathway is the mesocortical, starting from the VTA to the prefrontal cortex, and is involved in cognition, motivation, and emotions, also a target for schizophrenia. Um, there is the nigrostridal pathway, which starts from the substantia nigra to the dorsal stridum, and it is key for voluntary movement, reward and cognition, and this pathway is important because blocking dopamine receptors here by neuroleptic drugs gives debilitating side effects such as tardive dyskinesia, akathisia, and um, they are not desirable. There is the tuberal infundibular pathway comprising of the pituitary and the hypothalamus which is involved in endocrine functions and again neuroleptics blocking dopamine receptors in this pathway leads to side effects such as hyperprolactinemia. So from here we see that dopamine is widely distributed and we want to block selectively only a specific receptor subtype in an isolated brain region. And this is another figure showing the neuroanatomy and the location of dopamine receptors in striatum, which we will study. And as we can see, there are other neurotransmitters, and it's quite complex to just isolate the D2 receptor subtype. What are the types of antisense approaches to modify biological processes? There are the antisense oligos, which are short, about 20 to 24 base pairs, double-stranded DNA. And there are the antisense RNA compounds, which contain a cDNA encoding antisense RNA, which can be expressed by a non-viral or viral plasmid vector. And what are some of the advantages of the antisense compounds over the traditional pharmacological drugs? They can be very selective only for a given receptor subtype. They don't cause target receptor upregulation, as you will see in the talk. And actually, Dr. Weiss's group showed this for the oligos before I joined, that the antisense oligos block dopamine receptors but don't cause receptor upregulation. And the antisense RNA can have a prolonged effect after a single administration. And first, I will just give a little background on the effects of antisense oligos to the teacher receptor because when I joined Professor Weiss's lab, 
His team had been working several years on antisense oligos to the D1 and D2 receptor. When to study the oligos in the antisense RNA, we want a model of increased dopamine receptors. And for this purpose, our group used the 6-hydroxydopamine model of dopaminergic supersensitivity. Most of you probably know it, but I will summarize that injection of the neurotoxin 6-hydroxydopamine into the substantia nigra destroys the dopaminergic terminals. And this causes supersensitivity of the postsynaptic membrane in increasing dopamine receptors. And this is the control on lesion um, stridum where there is no dopaminergic supersensitivity. And when challenged with dopamine agonists such as apomorphine, L-dopa, or the D2 agonist Quinperol or D1 agonist SKF3393, these animals rotate in a direction contralateral to the lesion, whereas spontaneously they rotate in a direction ipsilateral to the lesion. In first, the group saw that repeated injections of a D2 antisense oligo is compared to random oligo. Random oligo, for those of you that are wondering, is um, the same as the antisense, but the uh, nucleotides are in a scrambled position to rule out any non-specific effect. In repeated ICV treatment with either oligo into the lesion stridum of 6-hydroxydopamine lesion mice, the D2 oligo significantly decreased the contralateral rotations in response to challenge with quinterol, which means that it blocked D2 receptors. This is the effects of the random molecule. This was not observed after challenge with the D1 agonist SKF3393 or with the muscarinic cholinergic agonist oxotremorine. These are, as you know, all neurotransmitters and receptors that could contribute to the rotational behavior. Next, it was seen that the more injections we give, the greater the effect of the antisense on the rotational behavior and therefore on blocking of teacher receptors. This is following 14 injections. And finally, that the effect of the D2 or D1 antisense oligo lasts throughout the treatment it has to be repeatedly administered. For example, this is at 12 hours intervals for five days, and then once the administration stops, the behavior returns back to normal quite rapidly within several days. And so with this background, I will describe our studies on the antisense RNA to the D2 receptor produced by non-viral plasmid vector. Antisense RNA, as you know, is a single-stranded RNA, complementary to the mRNA, and it um, hybridizes to it and prevents the translation through several mechanisms, RNA age degradation, block of ribosome entry, to name a few. The antisense RNA is a physiological mechanism for controlling gene expression. It may be synthesized by a plasmid vector. And what are some of the advantages that we reasoned antisense RNA would have? When we started these studies, there was no antisense RNA to the dopamine receptor. It was used, um, but to other targets. It can be synthesized continuously by a plasmid vector in the cell. 
in a single administration will be sufficient to block the expression of the target receptor for a long time. It will be necessary to give just a single or less frequent injections, unlike the oligos which you saw that require frequent administration. It is more stable. Oligos have to be modified to be more stable in brain, and this leads to their toxicity. And finally, the vector expressing the antisense RNA may be engineered with a cell or tissue-specific promoter, and this will confer great specificity, especially for gene therapeutic purposes. We were wondering what type of vector to choose. There are, as you know, the non-viral plasmic vectors and the viral vectors. Each have its advantages and disadvantages. The non-viral vectors are easy to work with, non-infectious. They are episomal and therefore they have lower risks for positional side effects due to chromosomal integration. However, they give relatively lower transfection efficiency in uptake, especially in brain, and it has to be optimized. And they have a shorter duration of effect than the viral vectors. The viral plasmid vectors, such as AV, adeno, and herpes simplex virus, which now are also used for optogenetics, they have higher transfection efficiencies, allow the cloning of larger genes, and they have longer persistence in neurons. However, with respect to long-term safety, there is always the concern of integration in the genome in some mutagenesis, although measures are taken. And Briefly to describe the mechanism of antisense action, this is the vector producing the antisense RNA. It hybridizes to the mRNA and blocks its translation. And this is the mechanism by which we administer the antisense RNA to increase the uptake of the plasmid we couple the negatively charged DNA to a positively charged cationic lipid. We chose the cationic lipid don't tap through literature search. And we prepared liposomes by sonication for 10 minutes in artificial CSF. The particles are uptaken through the membrane and they can go into either the nucleus or they may enter lysosomes where they are degraded. In the nucleus, the antisense RNA is produced and it can inhibit the target RNA either in the nucleus or somewhere in the cytoplasm and ultimately prevent the expression of the protein. And now since this is a new technique which Every neuropharmacologist wants to ascertain the mechanism of the drug that they are using. We had to show that the antisense RNA actually acts by an antisense mechanism in reason that several conditions have to be met. First, we have to show that the vector localizes in the cell and persists for a sufficient time to produce a biological effect. Then that it generates antisense RNA, that it reduces the levels of the target transcript, and that it produces specific biological effects. And finally, hopefully we can show that there is a temporal correspondence between the presence of the vector in brain and any specific biological effects. In first to do this, we chose HK293 cells, stably transfected with the long isoform of the T2 receptor, because in vitro cultured cells can be grown to larger amounts, and they are a better starting material for mechanistic studies for RNA, protein, 
it's more difficult to do these studies with mouse brain. As you know, mice are more limited and we have to well plan the experiments. And so first to clone the D2 antisense RNA, I chose this vector, a non-viral plasmid vector, which already had been used in brain, and started with total mouse triadal RNA, and designed primers for the D2 receptor, encompassing the third interest the cytoplasmic loop, which is the most divergent among the different dopamine receptor subtypes. In using first cDNA synthesis and then PCR, I subcloned this part of the D2 receptor into the vector. However, this vector was not convenient to use in the cells because they were already resistant to neomycin. So, I subcloned it into another vector for in vitro use. And this is the vector that was used for the HK293 cells. The sequence of the antisense is the same. After transfecting the vector into the cells, I obtained stable transfectants and found that they indeed contain the D2 antisense RNA. These are the cells transfected with the D2 antisense RNA vector. These are with the empty vector, and this is a positive control. This is the um, parental cell line, and these are HK cells that don't contain the D2 receptor. And this was another step, blotting and hybridization to a P32 ribochrome complementary to the D2 antisense RNA. Next, we saw that the cells stably transfected with the D2 antisense RNA don't have the D2 receptor transcript. This was seen only for two of the stable clones, and the third clone, for some reason, contained the D2 antisense transcript. Maybe it wasn't blocked. And to show that the transfection procedures or the selection of the cells didn't lead to any non-specific effects, this was a positive control with the housekeeping gene. And then finally, the cells that had less um, D2 mRNA and contained the Antisense also showed lower levels of D2 receptors in a radioligon binding assay. We always compare the effects of the D2 antisense RNA vector to that of the empty vector. And in summary, I hope that um, I convinced you that the D2 antisense RNA vector likely acts by a true antisense mechanism in the HK293 TL cell system because it synthesizes RNA, reduces the level of the receptor mRNA, and reduces the levels of D2 receptors. And next, we proceeded to study the D2 effects of the D2 antisense RNA in mouse brain. And for this, we used the original vector that you already saw, which is smaller, it's half the size of the in vitro vector, and it's more convenient for injections. And we complexed it with the lipid delta in a ratio 2.5 DNA to 1 delta. This was determined empirically is the best um, ratio that gives the higher uptake of DNA. And then we injected 6-hydroxydopamine lesioned mice into the lesion stridum, and we saw that the D2 antisense RNA expression vector localizes in the mouse stridum six days after a single injection. We extracted DNA and performed PCR with primers, which 
The T7 and SP6 primers which flank the vector polylinker. And therefore, in the antisense transfected, we had a band of 490 base pairs. And in the empty vector transfected, we had a band of approximately 190 base pairs, which is the size of the polylinker. And we did an additional control of restriction digestion with SAC1, which uh, recognizes a site within the dopamine receptor sequence and the vector, which yielded three fragments, the smallest one you can't see, it's about 41 base pairs. After this, we wanted to see for how long is the vector present in brain. And we injected mice with the D2 antisense vector, or just with DOTAP, and measured the presence of the vector, again with PCR, at various times. At 5 minutes, 3 days, um, 6 days. And it's again the same PCR. We saw that the vector is present up to 24 days in the mouse stratum after a single injection. And next, we wanted to see the spatial localization because we will be doing behavior. And this is again into the lesion stratum injection of the vector in in situ PCR. These are mice injected with the D2 vector in DOTAP, and this is just with DOTAP. And this time we did the PCR with incorporation of digoxygen in 11 DUTP in colorimetric detection. And we saw that the vector localizes not only in the injection tract, but within the vicinity several millimeters. Therefore, it will likely produce enough antisense RNA to inhibit the receptor. Next, we saw that a single intrastriatal injection of the D2 vector produces antisense RNA to the D2 receptor. This is, again, a single injection in the right stratum. We isolated RNA, and this is the presence of the antisense RNA but not in the left stratum, which was not injected. And we saw that a single injection of the D2 antisense vector reduces the levels of D2 receptors significantly as compared to the empty vector, but not the level of D1 receptors. And finally, we started studying the behaviors. We injected the vector into 6-hydroxydopamine lesion mouse, which has dopaminergic supersensitivity, and measured the contralateral rotations in response to Quinperol challenge at various times after a single injection. And we saw that the D2 antisense vector significantly inhibits the rotations even up to 28 days after a single injection, whereas the injection of the anti-vector has no effect. And we saw that the effect of the D2 antisense RNA is specific because it did not inhibit the contralateral rotations in response to the D1 agonist SKF393. In the next series of studies, we wanted to compare the D2 antisense RNA effects in vivo in normal sensitive mice in comparison with the typical neuroleptic haloperidol, which gives tolerance after repeated injections and also dopaminergic supersensitivity, which in humans results in the debilitating side effects such as tardive dyskinesia. And this is how peridol, as you know, it blocks the D2 receptors in the mesolimbic pathway, 
which is responsible for its antipsychotic actions in the blockade of the D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway is responsible for extrapyramidal side effects such as apathesia, dystonia, and Parkinsonism. First, we wanted to see that because now we are using the normal sensitive mice, that the D2 antisense vector can inhibit the D2 mediated behavior in normal sensitive mice. And we inject it bilaterally into the striatum, the D2 antisense vector with dotap or control antivector with dotap. And six days later, the mice were challenged either with quinferol, and we measured the stereotypy in response to quinferol. This is a D2 mediated behavior or they were challenged with the D1 agonist SKF3893, and we measured the grooming in response to a D1 agonist, a D1-mediated behavior. And we saw that the D2 antisense vector significantly blocked the uh, stereotypy um, induced by quinterol, but not the grooming resulting from a challenge of SKF38393. Next, we used another behavior. Blocking of D2 receptors will cause catalepsy. We gave a single bilateral injection in both strida in mice, and at various times thereafter, we measured the catalepsy. And we saw that the single injection of the D2 antisense vector significantly caused a catalepsy, cataleptic response up to 35, six days, whereas um, injection of the empty vector or the vehicle dotap did not, in the levels of catalepsy, there were similar as in the untreated mites. Next week, um, determined the effects of haloperidol on catalepsy in mice. As you can see, in order to induce catalepsy, we have to administer haloperidol repeatedly. This is um, haloperidol 0.6 micromole per kilogram IP daily for 21 days. We see catalepsy during the time of treatment which rapidly decreases when we stop treatment. And then to see whether the D2 vector will cause tolerance to the catalepsy, again, we gave a single bilateral injection of the D2 vector or repeated treatment with haloperidol. And after the last injection of the haloperidol or 26 days after the vector treatment, we gave an acute challenge with haloperidol, which should cause catalepsy. And the vehicle treated mice showed catalepsy. The haloperidol mice had tolerance to the catalepsy. The D2 antisense vector treated mice did not show tolerance and the empty vector treated mice did not. So therefore, the D2 antisense vector has the advantage of blocking D2 receptors without causing tolerance. Next, we used another behavior, which is used to evaluate the effects of neuroleptics, inhibition of apomorphine-induced climbing in mice another D2 mediated behavior. We administered a single bilateral injection of the D2 antisense vector in mice, and we saw that it inhibited the apomorphine induced climbing for prolonged periods of time up to 30 days. With haloperidol, 
we had to administer haloperidol continuously um, for 21 days. And during the administration, haloperidol inhibited the climbing induced by apple morphine. However, after the last injection, the climbing response not only would return to the normal, but it was super sensitive. And this is likely due to the increase of D2 receptors, which is seen in the clinic. And here we tested um, two different doses of apple morphine, and we saw that haloperidol uh, can give a super sensitive response even when we use the lower dose of apple morphine for micromole. And this super sensitive response correlated with higher levels of D2 receptors after treatment with haloperidol at the times at which we saw the super sensitivity, but not after the D2 antisense vector. And these are the, always the controls with anti vector and vehicle. And finally, we wanted to um, determine the effects of the D2 antisense on blocking a functional pool of D2 receptors because Dr. Weiss thought that these effects are different from haloperidol because by blocking the synthesis of RNA and receptors, the D2 antisense blocks only the functional pool of receptors. And for this purpose, we use FNM, which is an irreversible D2 receptor antagonist, and it blocks all D2 receptors. And then we administered bilaterally in the stratum the D2 antisense vector, and we measured the catalepsy, which is an indication of a D2-mediated behavior, and indirectly we can um, determine the synthesis of D2 receptors. And we saw that the D2 antisense vector delays the recovery of catalepsy. When we inject FNM, there is catalepsy because we block all D2 receptors and then they're gradually synthesized. As you can see with the empty vector, the catalepsy gradually disappears. However, the D20 sense vector delays the recovery of catalepsy, which means that it delays the synthesis of functional D2 receptors. And we correlated this with the levels of D2 receptors and we can see that the D2 antisense vector delayed the synthesis of D2 dopamine receptors after their irreversible blockade with FNM. And therefore, to summarize the effects of the D2 antisense RNA vector in vivo, the biochemical effects are that the D2 antisense vector is present in the stratum after a single injection for a long period of time, at least 24 days. It synthesizes RNA to the D2 receptor transcript and it reduces the levels of D2 receptors. In the behavioral effects, the D2 antisense vector produces selective and specific long-term inhibition of D2-mediated behavior in mice with dopaminergic supersensitivity. It produces a long-term effect on a D2-mediated behavior catalepsy and apomorphine-induced climbing. However, unlike haloperidol, the D20 sense vector does not upregulate D2 receptors and finally, that it blocks a pool of functional D2 receptors. And um, this can be used as a viable strategy to block D2 dopamine receptors 
both for experimental and therapeutic purposes. And to summarize briefly, the approaches are pharmacological drugs, antisense oligos, antisense RNA, RNAi, CRISPR gene editing, optogenetics. And for experimental purposes, the choice of a teacher receptor blocking approach will depend on several factors, including the investigator preference, the process studied, the lab resources, and um, it may be advantageous to confirm a given finding with two different methods. Also, sometimes the antisense RNA is easier to use with because it doesn't need additional light or additional manipulations. For therapeutic purposes, all of these approaches can be used. The choice will depend on the condition treated, the efficacy and adverse effects, the patient's condition, again the cost, and it will be a discussion between the physician and the patient. We know that we aim towards individualized therapy, so it's good to have several possibilities. And to thank the people who contributed to the studies, this is my mentor, Professor Ben Weiss, who was an amazing mentor, and I'm so thankful to him to introducing me to neuropharmacology and neuroscience. Um, Dr. Sui Zhang helped a lot with the uh, radio ligand binding assays. Um, and some of the behavioral experiments. Dr. Long Wuzhou um, was an expert in the behavior, and Mark Morabito was an expert in stereotoxic injections. And in conclusion, again, thank you, Lindsay, Rebecca, Ben, and Ali for the wonderful video symposium and the audience for your attention. Um, and uh, for any questions about the study or if anyone has ideas for collaborative work on D20 sense RNA vector for experimental or therapeutic purposes, please contact me. I will be happy to discuss and collaborate. When I did these studies, I was um, quite new to the U.S. system with grants just several years, and I was intimidated by the grant system and didn't know if I would be able to secure enough funding to be an independent yeah. investigator. But now I think I'm more familiar, have written grants, and would love to work on this area. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so remember, if you want to post questions, go to the screen, screen chat, and I will let well, I'll read out loud your questions. While someone in the meantime, I, I have a couple of questions on my own. First, on the temporal resolution for the onset. So you showed that the effect will stay for several days, like up to 30, 40 days, depending. How long does it take for the uh, effect to start? So how long will it take for you to inhibit D2 expression? And so a few hours, minutes? It's about two to three days for okay. the D2 receptor. So we assume in vivo that takes the time for the antisense RNA to be synthesized and to um, bind to the D2 mRNA and to inhibit the receptors. And uh, another question that I have is more relative to the specificity. Uh, so D2 receptors, if you inject it into a shatter, will are all present in cortical terminals, dopaminergic terminals, uh, uh, indirect pathway neurons, and some interneurons. So have you looked into the identity of the cells or like trying to think or reverse to experiments to be like if it's, Effects, if the effect you're looking at is specifically on the two receptors in a certain cell type or a certain terminal? That's a good idea, Mariana. We haven't because we just started the studies, but it will be a good question to follow up and to dissect 
where exactly we see the effect. It's a little bit more difficult with the mouse brain because it's a small area in the striatum we inject. And that's why I designed the in situ PCR to have a spatial resolution. Now with the advanced microscopy and so many markers, that would be a wonderful study. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from Andrew. So he's curious about whether there is a compensatory or homeostatic regulation of D3 receptors after the antisense injections. And relatedly, why is antisense RNA different from haloperidol, which does show D2 up regulation? So that's a wonderful question, Andrew. Thank you. This is because the antisense RNA has a different mechanism. It blocks just the mRNA whereas haloperidol blocks D2 receptors all throughout the brain regions where there are D2 receptors. And um, the antisense RNA just blocks the synthesis of receptors. They are only a small percentage, maybe about 20% of the functional pool, whereas haloperidol has a non selective effect on receptors everywhere in both functional and non-functional. And it's a pharmacological drug, it's an antagonist. It's a um, chemical drug, whereas this is a genetic drug. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. So, this is you know, there's this big sort of divide between the work we do with mice and actually translating it to to humans, right? Which is sort of the end goal of all these type of works. So, is there are there any plans that you have? How do you see this uh, sort of being at some point translated to being uh, tested and, and potentially used in human patients? So that's a very good question. Thank you, Ben. I think. Um, it could be translated because there is gene therapy and vectors for gene therapy are developed. It's given just as a single injection in brain. And there is a paper, um, I had one slide with it, uh, that the same vector is used by another group um, at Edward Jeans and uh, Barry Richmond at NIMH uh, in monkeys to inject in rhinal cortex and to study learning. And they um, are able to study the behavior. The vector is non-toxic, so if in primates it can be injected, uh, this means that in humans it will also be able to be developed as a gene therapeutic approach. For example, for a disorder that has increased D2 receptors, I think that the main issue is to have a vector which is safe. Maybe in this respect, the AVs are more developed for gene therapy. And um, a vector which can be delivered very selectively to the region where the D2 receptors are increased. So it was very feasible, that was the ultimate goal, but it has to be studied. Yeah, and related to that, of course, is uh, what type of disorder would you think this would be most applicable to at the beginning? So if it's for D2 receptors, because um, we can also target D3 maybe or D4, um, for D2 schizophrenia, also, I think in addiction, we know that initially the D2 receptors are low, but then with the development of addiction, they increase. So depending on the stage, I think that D2 receptors in addiction can also be targeted. Um, also, alcohol addiction I'm talking about. Also, I think it would be a useful tool to study for food addiction. And um, in Huntington's disease, there is hyper, 
dopaminergia, so it would also be used there, although in Huntington's we know that the mechanisms is different. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I'll give the stage to Mariana to introduce our uh, next speaker. Okay, so thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. And